the aim of the meetup is to bring together people working in the events community. Um, we just wanted to create um, an environment where we can share ideas and best practices and help to find some sort of new innovations in, in events in, in Ireland. So it's just really great for everybody to kind of meet and network and, and get to know each other and hopefully really do some interesting stuff in events. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the glowing review. <laughs> uh, so, yes, as uh, Natalie mentioned, I will be talking to you on why diversity is important for you, your events. So, a tiny bit about who I am, uh, besides the amazing title. My title is a bit long otherwise, which I normally say I'm a coder, I'm a mentor, which is not in there, I'm a tech event organizer, and I also advocate diversity in tech, and I do love cats. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview and how I got involved with the community and how diversity kind of came into that and why it's important and then, I'll, and then I'll go through why diversity is important for your events. So this is how I got started. For those, um, uh, so for, for me, I'm, since I'm a coder, I'm a, um, I love technology and anything to help me. So back in the early 2000s, I came across this uh, technology, this language called Python. And about um, in 2004, a meetup group appeared. Um, at the time, you have to understand there's no such thing as meetup.com. Um, in the early 2000s, I was lucky to have about maybe two technical talks in a year. That is outside my company. And there's normally held, I think it was a company called Iona. And I didn't have a clue what they're talking about, but I got to talk with other people besides my colleagues. And then Python Ireland came around, and I was excited because Python was a new language, and I wanted to talk to my peers. And also, um, when I was looking up the job sites, there was only two entries for Python developers compared to nowadays. And it was actually created by the person who founded Python Ireland. So, uh, the, so they took a hiatus in 2005, another person rebooted it. <coughs> he was sitting in a pub nursing his pint by himself for about a couple of months until we turned up. Um, he did have a sign and everything. So it's no, not, not every, so no, ha having a meetup, sometimes you just have to persevere. So a bunch of us came along and we wanted to have speakers and we wanted to talk about this technology. But no one was doing anything, so I said, okay, I'll have a go. And by mid-2005, I took over running Python Ireland. And as you can see, um, I've been running Python Ireland from 2005 to around 2016, so quite a long time. And uh, because the community has been amazing. And in, in, so in, in between there, you, um, we decided to run a national Irish conference called PyCon Ireland. And the whole reason for that was, um, in 2009, we went to a European Python conference called EuroPython, and they were looking for a next host city. So the core group of us that meet up every month, we were there. And while, we're, while they were announcing they were looking for a next host city, I was sitting in the back, they were, my friends were sitting in the front, they all turned around and looked at me. I go, no, we cannot host this. We can barely get about 20 people turning up at best. You know, we normally have about six people turning up every month, but we have an interesting talks. It goes peaks at 20, like woo. So um, that I, I uh, so I remember um, in Neary's, as you do, where all ideas come from in the pub. I was a sober one, so I, for my facts, are probably more correct than the others. Um, they said we have to run a conference. I said, okay, we're definitely not doing your Python. Uh, let's do an Irish one. Okay, let's do one now. I said, what do you mean now? Like in two months? I said, that is not possible. Like, so we were meeting in February. They wanted one in April. And I said, we have no clue what we're doing. We have no sponsors, no venue, no... Sp we, we just barely had meetups with speakers and event, you know. So uh, I managed to convince them to have the conference in July. Well, we all agreed. I don't know how we got there in the end. But they drunkenly agreed, and I was really relieved at that stage. But when, when the conference came around, we thought we might have about 40 people. We had nearly 100 people turned up. And I go, where were ye? Um, you know, uh, you just came out of woodwork. And they had people from international waters coming over. Because at the time, um, because um, PyCons, the, the original PyCon was held in the US, quite big. There's EuroPython, the European one. And then there's one in Germany and France. So there's around, all along globally, about six PyCons, including our one. So they're obviously very curious what we're doing over here. So we had the chair of the Python Software Foundation coming over, who looks after the trademark of the language. And, and they, he was helping us out with registration and stuff. And I was asking him, say, how do you have any tips on how to make this better? Um, you, you, you learn how the, the, the ropes by probably failing, at, failing after about 12 of these conferences. And I was like, oh, I nearly ran out the door at that stage. 
So the thing is, the community is very uh, it's small, and everyone's really friendly and willing to help each other. So um, since then, like um, I ran the first four conferences, um, like uh, with my husband was helping me out as well, and um, we grew from 100 to 150 to 280 to to like nearly 400. So basically, capping it at how how many people the hotel can hold as in the plenary session. I think currently that's what they, they have at the moment, they're capping at that amount of people. So that's how I got into events and somehow stayed in that community for a long time. So um, with regard to diversity, I'll come back to that later when uh, relating to Python community. So around 2012, um, uh, a friend of mine uh, somehow uh, talked me into organizing an event a game jam, so a game jam is a game making event. Because I was very jealous of her owning her own indie studios, making her own game, and she was asking me, why don't you make a game? And every time I say, I don't have time, I said, and then she got so annoyed, she said, right, here's what we do. Since you love organizing stuff, let's organize an event so you can make a game. So that's how it started. So I made my first game, but I enjoyed organizing so much and meeting the people in the community um, that we just kept on going. So since that, um, since, uh, 2012, we ran uh, nearly 30 events. So since she was doing business um, all, um, via her company, she brought the game jams to the various locations. So London is where we went. Uh, we went to, New, uh, went to New York as well, in Vienna. I primarily focused um, Ireland itself, and uh, it's a not-for-profit um, uh, organization, and it's primarily um, adults who come together in a day. Uh, get announced a theme, they make a game, they play each other's game, the best one, best, the favorite game uh, wins prizes. The, but the whole point of it was to gather students, hobbyists, devs, indies, creatives, uh, anyone who's curious about making games. So it's not about your typical, oh, I'm a coder, uh, only I can go to game jams. It's open to people who are um, with uh, an intersection of, uh, of, of um, the society as well as interdisciplinary uh, kind of skills. So um, it's, and it's not just digital games, so the picture there you see people with computers, but people make games that are analog games, like tabletop games as well. Um, so um, I got to um, end up having a good relationship with the Irish indie community uh, since then, and it's a really, it's a growing industry. Uh, in fact, I, only, I came, just came from the Dublin Games Summit, and uh, so that's how much it's grown since. Um, there's nearly 40 indie game studios, which uh, um, based here in Ireland, and uh, they have a not-for-profit that represents them called Immers. And uh, and to me, like it's really important that uh, to to be connected to that community because they are trying to help. By by connecting with them, um, I get to um, uh, first of all I get to collaborate, and um, I get access to a lot of resources, um, and also. Um, I could, uh, they also, uh, they, it's also, they also do have um, uh, a grant, uh, which I would love to provide for people, but um, since I'm a, a kind of an um, uh, organization, I run a lot of events myself. For them, they have a group of people that provided this grant for a Games Developer Conference, and it was like 46,000 euros, I think, and they managed to bring um, like 10 to 12 people over, like, like, it's like financial aid, bring, being able to bring people over to an international conference and provide that opportunity for them to um, to connect with professionals. So for me, on the outside, that was an amazing, and that's something that I want to be able to do as well. Um, so, meantime, I was busy in 2012. So we mentioned Coding Grace there. So Coding Grace is a female-friendly um, kind of, uh, it's workshops that are female-friendly, and I primarily the person who organized them. Um, I also um, mentored some of them. And this started off because a friend, the same friend who got me into organizing the game jams, um, had this problem um, that uh, coding, kids coding clubs, um, the number of girls that turn up are low, but after a few weeks, why did, where did they disappear to? This is back in 2012. She brought myself, a few engineers, um, I invited my husband to come along as well. The usual case of brainstorming and wondering what is the problem? Is it the boys are too boisterous? Not enough, girls didn't have enough pure role models? So we're trying to figure out maybe we do a program in the summer. We came up with the name, Coding Grace, went through a lot of cheesy names, but a bunch of us came up with Coding Grace, an homage to Grace Hopper. And then, uh, then after a few months, like nothing happened, and I said, oh, I need to get something done. So for me, as a person that I really want some, to do something, uh, my husband suggested, since you like to organize events, especially uh, um, events for adults, why not um, organize workshops? 
and uh, so that's what I did in May 2013. I organized the very first Python workshop. We had over 30 people turn up. The people who came and mentor were, were all volunteers. And since then, we ran like over 90 workshops in um, so various different technologies, not just coding. We did animation and games, as well as um, kind of uh, electronic, like wearable electronics. Um, so the volunteers themselves, um, so all, all these workshops, um, all our mentors are volunteers from the industry. So again, amazing community, amazing support. And it's nothing, um, nothing is better than having a person in the room to be able to raise your hand and ask questions. And because I emphasize all our events that it's never s stupid to ask a question, everyone starts somewhere, somehow, and, uh, and um, that's how you learn. Uh, but uh, we have, like I mentioned there, there's an asterisk there with nearly 30 volunteer mentors. There used to have a lot more because of the GDPR reminder the other month. Um, the, uh, the, the people might, might, might have forgotten to click, I want to be contacted if, if I want in future events. So I used to have over 80, so there was a big drop, but that means I, I saw the positive side, so that means I don't have to have a huge amount of technology to run workshops on. I can just focus on the selection of, of technologies. Um, so that's not too bad. So I was like, a, I was a bit worried, like no one would actually respond. So that was my worst case scenario. Uh, on our monthly newsletter, which is pro uh, from Coding Grace, we have um, over 450 subscribers, which is not too bad. Um, I only. Uh, so even after GDPR, so I was pretty happy with that. And we, uh, what I do is I collate kind of all the community events, uh, especially the diversity ones, and share that with people because you, they're all over the place on, if you try to look for it online. So I spend about a week trying to take notes and find out what events are coming up. So general events, but the specific, for me, the specific focus is trying to find diversity in tech events. Um, so that's that. So it's only a year later. So as I said, this is um, PyLadies, which is related to Python. So I'm c coming back to Python-related kind of communities again. So in 2013, um, I founded PyLadies Dublin. The, it's a uh, mashup of words, it's Python and ladies. So why did I do that? That was, if you remember, I ran PyCon Ireland. I, I was a chair until 2013. That was the year I actually, so 2012, 30, 2013 was me trying to figure out how to encourage more women to go to events and attend workshops. And that year, I was so psyched that I got the very first female keynote to, um, uh, to come over from San Francisco. She just so happens to be the co-founder of the San Francisco chapter of PyLadies. And I thought that was a sign for me to launch PyLadies Dublin. So as you do, so as, <laughs> so as you can say, I had, uh, uh, so I had, uh, so this is, so with Python Ireland, I have, I have Coding Grace, I have GameCraft, and now I have PyLadies Dublin. So this is a free monthly event that we host, and uh, we encourage people to give short talks. It has changed, the format has, is kind of changed. It's a still a free, free kind of structured event. But now, at the, currently, we encourage people to give short talks, and, and the rest of the evening, we encourage people to either deep dive with the speaker, work on their own projects, pair up and do tutorials. Uh, so it's kind of a ver trying to make that a practical evening, but they're also welcome to just uh, not, do, not, not do any coding and just chat as well. So guess what? I, uh, I didn't find enough, uh, I wasn't the founder of this one, but I got invited to join as a director of Women Code Dublin 2015. And the reason was, it's not, well, besides that, um, it's, I, I'm not crazy, but uh, there is a reason for this, is because um, they have a really huge network, and they're dedicated to help women excel in their careers in tech. So it's very similar to Coding Grace, whereas my one was aimed at people who have no programming experience upwards, they're more aimed at professional women. They have 13,000 members across 14 countries, and in Dublin, they have uh, over 1,300 uh, members. So they're quite big and, and, and it's an amazing network. So why I joined was a uh, group, there was more and more female and tech groups appearing. And when I saw this appear, I, it was uh, co-founded with uh, Laura, who runs Women Tech Makers, and Christina, who runs Ireland Girl Geek Dinners. So those three directors. So I was hoping that between the three of us, we will try to complement each other uh, because our community is small enough already and uh, also know when we're running events so we don't clash. Um, it still clashes every so often, um, but uh, we're working on it. Uh, but now we've, uh, the team has grown 
to we have a, an additional um, uh, director and another city lead. So, uh, so it's great to see that they have a bunch of resources, and I'm trying to figure out how to have similar amount of volunteers to help me with my other organisations. Um, so that's what new code. So, after all the organisations I co-founded and joined. Um, you, there's lots of other ones that are currently um, here in Ireland that, that, um, that you can actually just collaborate and get involved with. So Women in Technology and Science Ireland, for those you haven't heard of, they've been around for over 28 years. And I was one of their executive board members, I'm still a member, and I, I held them in high regard because um, a lot of diversity in tech um, uh, community groups, um, they... Um, as opposed to women tech, uh, technology and science, um, they get uh, uh, wits gets invited to uh, policy making decisions, you know, up in government level. So for me, that's quite important. Uh, a lot of the groups that, are, um, that we have right now, we just go and meet up, network, and that's I think we don't really follow up with other kind of other other higher level stuff. So I thought it was really important to um, have a tech representative at women in technology and science. Funny that technology is in their, in their title, but at the time when I was joining, joined them, it was mainly academics, science, engineers, but there's not that many tech people. Uh, so that's why I made it my mission to try and encourage more, to get more tech people to join. So the <coughs> other ones are collaborating. So for me, I deal, as I said, I, um, I run a lot of events that are geared towards 18s and um, plus and uh, over, 18 plus events. So. Uh, with, so with kids, because of the child protection laws and guard vetting rules here, it's very strict. So um, I collaborate with Coda Dojo, who run family-friendly coding sessions, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, running workshops in Spirefist, like family-friendly uh, board game making uh, workshops. And Women Tech Makers, which is um, uh, Laura from Women Code Dublin, she, invite, she invited me to run kind of uh, uh, te technical workshops in some of her events in the past. So there's other groups there, so you don't have to um, find that there is something missing and go and start up a group. Uh, you can actually join and collaborate with lots of groups because right now there are lots of groups here. Um, so this is only a selection of some of the groups that are um, in Dublin. And uh, the one I want to highlight the one is uh, the one on the top left, Lovelace Space. It's, um, so Lovelace, uh, it's like eight after Ada Lovelace. It's a, it's a make, feminist maker space. So um, it's uh, it's open to uh, uh, everyone from all uh, from different backgrounds to come along. All you want to do is just want to make make stuff, and uh, and there's no internal politics or anything like that. So and it's a relatively new group. We don't have the, they don't have a space, but we we're running events. So again, it's a more about community building, and because it's open and, and inclusive to um, uh, to kind of a, a diverse audience, we want uh, so. That's why I put it up there, even though it's not tech tech. Um, but it's cool because it's a maker space. That means hopefully we'll get a, a space of our own and we'll have laser cutters and everyone can play with power tools. Um, <laughs> so as I said, there are lots and lots of women in tech and diversity in tech uh, kind of uh, organizations. I, this is a, a medium post. I decided to collate, um, I thought it'd be a half a dozen, or I thought it'd be a dozen groups or so. There's actually um, nearly 40 groups around Ireland, and I have them listed in this post. And um, so, uh, um, so most of them are based in Dublin, um, some in, and then followed by Belfast, Galway, and then there is some in Cork. I think there's one or two in Cork. So um, I was really surprised by that. Um, so we're getting. So for me, there was a tiny bit of concern that it that the groups were kind of fragmenting the community a little bit. Um, but it's also a good sign. So, uh, so I'm always trying to look at the silver lining around lots of these things. So, uh, but it, a lot of the community stuff that I'm involved with doesn't have to be based in Ireland. So oh, um, when I mentioned Python Software Foundation uh, when we started um, PyCon Ireland, so a couple of years later I was um, nominated as a fellow of the Python Software, Software Foundation, which was a, quite an honour. And because of that, in recognition of all the stuff that I've been doing, and on top of that, um, I got invited to join their grants work group. So what this is, is um, uh, people submit um, requests for grants and funding for their Python-related workshops, conferences, um, especially like the diversity um, kind of uh, workshops. 
and there is pretty much nearly everyone in each continent um, uh, in, in the grants work group. So I'm, look, I'm one of the I'm so one of the few that are based in Europe. I'm the only one I know of that's in Ireland. So it's so um, to the scale of what we um, what they what, how they help the community is. Uh, they last year in 2017 we went through, including the board as well. We went through 220 applications. And over a quarter million dollars was uh, granted to um, various organisations who are running these events. And uh, I mentioned EuroPython earlier on um, because I had no clue about running a conference that big. So remember, we had about 100. So EuroPython at the time had about 200 and something, but which is we thought was huge. Um, nowadays, EuroPython um, they have over 2,000 people going to their conferences. So it's kind of they 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 really grew, but. I, when I, back in 2012, uh, I decided to join the board. They were looking for board members, and I was curious on how they ran conferences and how they scale up, because how do you scale from one to 200 to 300? And, um, and I wanted to learn, find out their mistakes. And they also created these things called work groups. So um, they included people from all over Europe to join and help like with the call for papers, or call for proposals, help with the programming, help, help with the website content, and the local teams will deal with the logistics um, and the, the local sponsors and all that. So it was a, a great, it was a, quite a learning experience and working with people remotely. So we had regular calls, uh, uh, video conferencing calls and, and stuff like that. So it was a um, really good experience. But what does it mean to me? Um, I get to meet a lot of cool people, so um, the community itself. So this was just very recent. This was in Spirefest recently, and these folks are actually from Hong Kong. Um, one of them, to the far left, she actually is the director of the Women Who Code Hong Kong. I kind of made it my mission since I found out that there was a few Women Who Code directors around <laughs> that was jumping around trying to find them, some take pictures. So, um, so, so that was cool. Taking silly pictures, that was one of them. So the top one is Game Crafts, the hope that was after one of Game Jams a number of years ago. Bottom one, bottom one is uh, PyCon Ireland. So uh, we had a good mix of people, again, volunteering, helping out. Another big one for, for me, we've been doing this a few years now, since uh, a, t a charity table quiz. Uh, we don't do pub quizzes because we are not very, te techies, geeks, myself included, are not very good at pop culture and all that kind of stuff. So well, what we decided to do is run a table quiz, which is geared towards like more geeky questions, and uh, why not make it a charity as well? So we've been um, donating to Dublin Simon community, and we were basically reaching out to as many tech community groups out there to come along that evening. So the logos on the side of that bucket, and um, that's like some of the some of the, that particular year, or some of the organisations that decides to get involved. Of course, Pi Ladies and Europython. I was re I'm really happy with this picture because. Uh, that year, happy memories, because uh, I wasn't, uh, I actually didn't plan to go to EuroPython, um, but it was by chance my husband got sent by work, so all I had to do was pay a flight. And uh, the EuroPython committee was very nice to offer me a full, uh, it's a week conference, they offered me a full week conference ticket for free. And all I asked was, can I go to your AGM? Because I'm always there on the phone and telling you, remind you that I'm there to vote and keep it, stop forgetting about me. So I want to be there in person. And they gave me a full week's conference ticket. So that were, the, they were amazing. So um, so remember I mentioned uh, the, San, the, the Pi Lady San Franciscan uh, kind of co-founder, uh, the keynote speaker that I invited in PyCon in 2013. Well, she's in the green t-shirt there in the background. We basically, over Twitter, just said, hey, how are you? I didn't know you're here. Oh, let's do a Pi Ladies lunch. OK, so we did an impromptu Pi Ladies lunch. That picture doesn't show you. There's over 2,000 people. And there's about 1,000 people on either side trying to queue up for food. And I have been holding down that front table for people to come along. It was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to meet a lot of, um, a lot of women from, uh, from their various different backgrounds. Uh, and from different countries at that Pi Ladies lunch. So it was a really amazing experience. It was really great um, that we came together. And of course, Inspirefest, I mentioned that earlier. We had like uh, working with Coda Dojo and, uh, and um, uh, to, um, uh, for family friendly coding sessions, as well as um, game making sessions. You can see that tiny picture in the top right. So, why diversity? To me, it's it's meeting like-minded people like myself. Um, 
because um, according to like Asteroid and um, uh, she said um, that uh, most of the general population aren't well uh, represented in our tech communities. So for me personally, um, uh, when it comes to diversity in conferences and events, I'm actually not looking for 50-50. I want the same opportunity for everyone who wants to be part of the meetups, the conferences and communities, be it they are attendees or volunteers to help out like mentoring, registration events, finding speakers or be speakers themselves. Uh, events are more interesting when there are more, f if there are more people from diverse backgrounds, and um, and say for instance, uh, there's partners who has uh, who wants to go to the same conference, but they have kids, so why not um, offer babysitting kind of uh, services? Um, for me, as a Chinese girl, I like to see someone like myself speaking at an event. Um, it does make me curious, and I want to attend and see what they want to talk about, and also make that connection with them, and not just virtually, actually face-to-face -face in person. A uh, friendly, inclusive community makes it inviting for more people to join in and help, and naturally it attracts more diverse speakers, attendees, and most importantly, more volunteers. So uh, this is a kind of a mind map from Emily Weber uh, from diversitycharter.org. It's basically based on her own research and her, basically her own experience and the initial list of barriers. So um, I'm just gonna, uh, so the, the, the link on that, uh, to that website um, is basically giving, you tip, giving event organizers a bit of tips about um, uh, what, how to make your event inclusive. And I'm gonna go through kind of some of the lists uh, from, her, from her page because I think it's a really good um, uh, overview. So um, let's take, Awareness of opportunities and events at the top left there. Um, so you can't have a diverse event if you cannot reach a diverse range of people in the first place. Uh, from speaker's point of view, so winding the pool of high quality submissions uh, will help create a diverse program. And if the, event, um, if the event is open submission, are you reaching a diverse range of people to tell them about the opportunity? Are you making additional effort to reach outside your network to find new speakers? Are you building a list of routes to find new people? And do you have a mentor programs for new speakers? Or are you connected to people that do? And do you encourage conference speakers or conference sponsors to consider diversity for speaking slots? And are you being too broad in your ask? Are the criteria for submission intimidating to some? And from the audience point of view, is having more diverse audience will encourage diversity? And are you reaching a diverse range of potential audience members are you making additional effort to reach outside of your network to find new or diverse audience members? So let's go down to the submission process, which is on the top left. Uh, so is the submission process geared towards a diverse range of people? Is your submission, process, submission criteria inclusive? Are you making the offer clear, such as expenses and free tickets? Are you reviewing your submission process with real users from diverse backgrounds? Do you offer support and mentoring through the submission process? Is your submission panel diverse and is the review criteria appropriate? Are you anonymizing submissions for review? And if you are, is that helping? And is diversity part of your event pr principles and vision? The next one is quite important is affordability. So, so for speakers, it is quite expensive to go and speak at an event. So providing them a free ticket is a great incentive, but by not, by not covering costs, it can make it impossible for them to speak at events because organizations may not cover their travel and accommodation costs. And let's not forget about freelancers. Um, they also have to factor in the costs of not working on days they're at the conference. So are you offering costs to cover expenses for the whole conference? Are you offering any additional payments or offers? So from the audience perspective, is your price affecting people's ability to come? Are you offering discounts, scholarships, or financial aid or incentives to encourage diversity? So, uh, and then now we're down to, uh, let's talk about confidence and content. So from for speakers, does the potential speaker feel confident in their content? Do they know they have an interesting story to tell? A lot of people don't think what they know is interesting to other people, so they don't speak at conferences. Are they confident in the way they're telling the story? 
Are they confident in putting together a slide deck? Do they have opportunities to practice and give feedback on content if they need it? And do you offer mentoring for speakers? So this is the confidence on stage. Uh, so that part of my map is on the bottom left hand side. So does the potential speak speakers feel confident being on stage in front of lots of people? Hello, people. <laughs> do they feel physically confident on stage? Do they know how to stand, where to put their hands, how to project their voice? Are they able to understand and deal with physical reactions of being on stage? Do they understand what they can do to help them relax? Are they confident with the audience? Do they know where to look? Do they have an idea on how to, how to read an audience? Are they okay with being filmed and having their voice amplified? Are you thinking about other formats for speakers like workshops, interviews, pairing them up with others? For an audience member's point of view, oh, relating to, sorry, relating to audience members, which is uh, at the bottom of the mind map there. So for speakers, looking out and seeing a crowd, um, uh, a crowd of people when none of them look like you is quite daunting. So do they recognize themselves in the audience? Are they comfortable answering questions from the audience? And from an audience perspective, do they feel confident networking with other people in the audience? Is there anything you can do to help new audience members connect with others? And do they feel comfortable asking questions of speakers? So, um, um, how much time do we left? We're good? We're running over. Okay, so we're near the end anyway. So, uh, let's talk in relating to, relation to speakers. Uh, relating speakers, which is in the middle there in the mind map. So for speakers, do they relate to the speakers in previous years and not feel like a token person? Do they relate to other speakers in the program? And from the audience point of view, do they relate to the people on stage and could they see themselves there one day? Um, understanding the value for me, which is on the right hand side of the mind map. So for speakers, are you making it clear what benefits are for speaking at the event? Are you sharing stories from former speakers from, about how it helped their networks, confidence, careers, and so on? And for the audience, are you making it clear what benefits are for attending an event? And are you sharing stories from former audience members via your blogs, your tweets, and so on? Inclusive language was at the top right-hand side there of the mind map. So are speakers, presenters at the event using inclusive language, say, not saying guys or dudes or he all the time? Are you making this part of the terms and conditions of participation, participating? And is the marketing material using inclusive language? Um, the venue, uh, events, are they meeting my needs? So that's in the middle of my map. So diverse audiences may have needs that you haven't considered and aren't catered for. So does the venue meet the needs of your speakers and participants? And have you done any research to find out what these are? And is your catering inclusive for dietary requirements? And the very last one was quite important, is feeling safe. So it is really important that your participants feel safe. There are many things to consider, and here are some of them. So do you have a code of conduct? And most importantly, are you prepared to act on it? Are your event staff focused on creating a safe environment? Is your environment inclusive? Are you welcoming people, making it easy for them to ask questions? Is your signage clear? And can your participants relate to your venue staff? So you can actually get, um, uh, see, uh, go see the list that I went through on diversitycharter.org. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> the charter is for event organizers, speakers, individuals, employers, sponsors, and venues. Um, by signing this charter, you are committing to highlighting where there is a lack of diversity at events and doing what you can to make things better. So I signed it. <laughs> so you see my name there. So I check check the website out. So. Some, an, a good resource is Change Catalyst. Um, they have an inclusive event toolkit. It's a free PDF that you can download after you um, give in, put in your details. And it has, it's, it, um, it has a more, it has a more in-depth kind of um, run through of what makes an inclusive event and, a, an actual phys and an actual checklist you can print out and go through. Um, one of the best um, example of an inclusive conference is AlterConf. Unfortunately, they, they've stopped running it. Um, the last event was last, uh, in, last was in December. But their website is still up, so I encourage people to have a look at it. They do have a code of conduct, 
But what is really cool is they have etiquette in there as well, how speakers and people and attendees should behave. Um, information for speakers on um, the type of slides, like the font size, the colors. Um, so check, check that uh, website out. Um, it's an amazing conference, but uh, the content is quite good as well. If you want to find more information and event guidelines, um, especially around diversity and inclusivity, check out Geek Feminism. It's a wiki, so um, you can actually go in and deep dive a bit further. And some references on some of the organizations I mentioned. Um, I'll be sharing these slides out. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening.